One of them was the Heart's End, her personal flagship on which was mounted Boyd Breaker, the largest dark lance ever created by a Drukhari artisan. The orcs had not fallen from the port gate. They had emerged far closer. No one. There was only one explanation for how they had come to be here, and so suddenly at that. Little inspired terror in the Drukhari, for their souls were jaded and hardened by the millennia of pain and suffering they inflicted on others in their own quests to satisfy the pull of she who thirsts and keep their mortality at bay. But something closed a cold fist around Dimira's heart now. A movement beside her alerted her to the presence of Sistriel Vern, coming up to stand next to her at the Tantalus's rail. The other Archon made no mention of how close he had come to death, nor and did not even pass comment on her presence on his craft. Instead, Vern's face was drawn and his eyes haunted, for he recognised the truth just as Dimera did. They are teleporting, Vern said, in a voice that was only flat because of the work being done to keep it under control. An archon could not let weakness be seen, lest their rivals seek to capitalise, and the ambitious trade was emboldened. And yet, Sistriel Vern was teetering on the edge of it. They are, Dimira agreed, and her own throat nearly betrayed her, because the enormity of what she had brought down upon them was starting to sink in. Kamara was a bastion against the malice and hunger of the warp a shelter in which the Drukhari lived out their lives and from which they only emerged for short periods, so the drain upon their souls from she who thirsts did not grow too great. The dark city had endured for over 10,000 years, but that did not mean that it was inviolable. The webway was breached, then attackers could reach Kamara's gates, and although a webway portal could only be operated by an Eldari, the minions of chaos had many tricks by which they could gain entry. Even the structure of the city was not fully safe, for during a disjunction the boundaries themselves could become breached. Entire subrealms could be lost and have to be sealed off with those left inside abandoned to their doom, simply in order to prevent the contagion from spreading any further. Teleportation was one of the most foolhardy practices undertaken by the younger species of the galaxy, for it involved literally throwing oneself through the warp with imperfect go- Only the warp spiders' aspect warriors of the craft worlds practised it amongst all the Eldari, and even they took great risks in doing so due to how their souls stood out like beacons in the warp. The Mon Key of the Imperium did their miserable best to insulate themselves from the warp's predators with the pathetic emblems of their shackled god, but no Eldari would risk such an imprecise method. The odds were good that demons would swarm to the light of an individual's soul and consume them, or worse, before they emerged again. And then there were the Orcs, the Arachia, who lacked even the human stumbling, flawed sense of self-preservation in such matters. Only the most heavily armoured, iron-willed monkey stood a chance of surviving teleportation, happily threw themselves through the warp with no concern, content in the knowledge that they would end up fighting something. Their methods were unshielded, haphazard and chaotic. And now they were teleporting inside Kamora. This was no longer just an insult, but a real threat, far greater than that posed by the orcs themselves or their crude but dangerous weapons. The orcish army might destroy buildings and slaughter Drukhari, but those were losses that Daimira was content to risk, so long as it was not her buildings or her life. The Arachia's teleportation, however, might open the way into Kamora for the demons that lurked in the warp, forever pawing at the walls separating them from the delicious morsels within. That could be ruinous. If a breach occurred, Dimira would not be safe even if she managed to escape into an... 
Asdrubale Vect would brook no threat to his domain, and his warriors would be given orders to isolate and execute any refugees from such a tragedy, just in case they had unknowingly brought the faintest seed of chaos out with them. We cannot wait for the witch cults, Dimira heard herself say. We must exterminate this threat ourselves immediately. Agreed, Sister Ulverne declared. He glanced sideways at Dimira and gave the faintest nod. It appeared that a genuine truce was traditional lip service. Dimira could not count on Vern and the cabal of the falling knight for a moment longer than it would take to wipe the orcs out, but until that moment, they could work together. Dimira vaulted up onto the rail of the Tantalus, balancing fearlessly above the gulf below, and gestured to the pilot of her venom to approach. The cold terror in her gut was already twisting into anger. How dare the Arachia threaten the very substance of her domain? How dare they overreach themselves in such a manner? They were her tools, but they had turned in her hand. Well, now she would exact her revenge and carve fear of her kind into their carcasses until the survivors were no more than wimbesh. She set her carrier waves to broadcast as far and wide as she could. Let her voice be heard by all those assembled here, and let them know that she was in command. Sharpen your blades and open the portals, Dimera Thrakes commanded. We ride to the death of our enemies. Chapter 9 Snaggy had chosen just the right moment to make his move, if he said so himself, which he did, although quietly to make sure no one overheard. Some grots, fools like Nisquick, were deluded enough to believe that he was as a servant to an orc. Nisquick didn't like being kicked around, yelled at and generally abused, but he was incapable of imagining anything else. Snaggy had never even tried to talk to the other Grot about the possibility of a life not at the mercy of orcish oppression because he knew a lost cause when he saw one. Then there were a the few Grots, like Snaggy, although no one was actually like Snaggy, but him, who recognised their condition for what it was. Intolerable. Unacceptable. The endlessly repeating tragedy of what happened when strength was allowed to win out over intelligence. The gods embodied the dual nature of the orcish species, both brutal and cunning in different amounts. But orcs themselves were essentially just squigs with the ability to use language and weapons. It was Grotz who were the true chosen of Gork and Mork, because they were not only willing to stick the other git, but capable of choosing the best time to do so. This was why Snaggy was a prophet of Gork and Mork, although he kept quiet about that around orcs because they tended to be unable to handle the truth of it. However, most grots sat in the middle. They didn't live in the unquestioning ignorance of those like Nisquick, who were only content with their lot because they couldn't conceive of anything better, but nor did they have the vision to actively envisage change. Most grots lived lives of sulky misery and casual spite, spreading their own suffering out to as many other life forms as they could get away with. Their directionless resentment was like a reservoir, released in little dribbles with a shank in here or the application of an oversized wrench to the shins of another grot there. But there was still a massive amount of potential energy just waiting to be tapped by a grot with the ingenuity to harness it. In a normal situation, that reservoir was sluggish and immobile. This, though, was far from a normal... Orcs had dragged them all through into wherever in the gods' names this was, a completely unnatural spiky city that was dark and smelled of dust and blood and death, but not in a fun, invigorating way, and everyone's nerves were on edge. Spikies were just plain old nasty, and that was an end to it. Every grot knew that beakies were rock-hard and deadly, and bug-eyes had too many arms and too many claws, and tinheads had guns what could blast you 
grip that you could imagine before you could say oi. And every grot was sensibly and justifiably terrified of these things. However, if there was one good thing about these possible deaths, and Snaggy wasn't convinced that there was, but if there was, it was that they would be quick. Spikies didn't make it quick. Spikies, in fact, seemed to rather enjoy dragging it out. Information was a bit scarce on exactly what they did, because no one really got away, and no grot with any sense hung around close enough to get a proper view. But it was the and their knives were to be avoided at all costs. So, that was where they were now. An awful lot of grots who'd been dragged, kicked and herded through alarming portals into a place with few obvious exits, and where the shadows into which they might normally flee quite conceivably harboured spikies with blades that thirsted for grot blood. The orcs were having a great time of it, of course, stomping anyone they came across and blowing up whatever they pleased. But the spikies who lived here kept appearing and attacking, then running away again before too many of them could be killed. Snaggy knew it was only a matter of time before the gits decided that the orcs were a bit too tough and that they wanted to... Typical spiky cowardice, wanting to fight grots just because they were easier to kill. This was exactly the sort of situation in which a skilled orator could reach out and take a listener's fears to give them just the right nudge. To turn that churning mass of guileless resentment and bile into something useful. This can't go on, he said to his twitching and flinching audience as they huddled together in the wreckage of a battle wagon that had been the victim of either spiky heavy weaponry or poor mech boy engineering. The orcs have gone too far this time. This ain't a place for the likes of us. We're bothering the spikies in their own holes and they're not going to rest until... He broke off, scowling at a scuffle at the back. What's going on over there? Gip, whom Snaggy had identified as large but lazy and therefore the perfect sort of hench grot, smacked the two smaller grots causing the disruption around the head. They were fighting about the sky. Couldn't agree if it's white and gold or black and blue. Snaggy peered upwards through a jagged hole in the thick metal and snorted. The sky was strange, that was true enough, with the weird glyphs that seemed to be burned on it but were only visible when you weren't looking directly at them. However, the colour was obvious. It was definitely... Well, actually, now we came to look at it. Honestly, don't know what you're squabbling about, he said with a dismissive snort. It's obvious what colour it is. But that's just me point, he continued hastily before anyone could ask him to express an actual opinion on the subject. This place is weird. Causes sensible grots to doubt the evidence of their own eyes. This ain't where the gods want us to be. How do you know what the gods want? Someone sneered from the middle of the crowd. Snaggy's eyes found him almost immediately. Scrawny even by grot standards, with the tip of his nose missing. Cos they talk to me, Snaggy said with simple pride and awaited his acclamation. A couple of his audience scoffed loudly, 